We're in a sermon series that I'm calling, So You Want to Be a Disciple. I said the first week of the series that we call ourselves Christians these days, but it's kind of lost the power because it means the little Christ or to become more like Christ. But I, I think it happened in a generation before with Catholicism where they were Catholics and they practiced and they had their traditions. But then there was a generation that didn't follow Catholicism, but they were, they were raised in a home and they were asked, even though they didn't go to church, what are you? And they'd say, well, we're Catholic, like you're American, you know, we're Catholic. I think that's happened with Christianity in America, where it doesn't really mean follower of Christ anymore. It has some negative connotation and we've lost it. So I like I've been saying I like follower of Jesus because that's pretty specific, isn't it? Like we're after it. We're trying to be more like Jesus. Uh, but a disciple is someone who follows Jesus with their whole heart. So this whole series is, are you a Christian? Okay, what's that mean? But are you a disciple? And if you want to be a disciple, then you have to give your all. It has to be all about Jesus and God and their priorities, God's priority. And it has, it has to be about prayer that we talked about last week. And then this week, we're going to talk about seven things as we go forward that, that, that mark disciples. And this week, we're talking about the Bible. So you want to be a disciple. Did you know that the Bible <clears throat> is the best-selling book of all time? Of all time. Let's give the Lord a hand on that one, all right? It's the best-selling book every year in America. It's not on the New York Times bestseller list because it's written in hundreds of versions and packaged in different ways with different publishers. But 25 million copies a year of, are sold of the Bible. So that's by far way above all of other books. You know why? Because it's an amazing book, and we're going to talk about that today. It's God's Word. I'll tell you something you probably didn't know. The Bible is also the most frequently shoplifted book in America. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I'm trying to think of the dynamics. You're kind of interested. I'm trying to think, why are they doing that? You know, you're kind of interested, but you're not sure you want to pay for that. So let's just snag it and see. But hey, you know, I just want you to know, we got them free here. We give them away. So if you want one, just ask for one when you go back to the table after service. But let me share with you three things that make this best-selling book, this book that has stood the test of time, this book that has lasted so long and so well. Let me tell you why. First of all, the Bible is the inspired word of God. Let's look at it in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed. That's why we say inspired. God-breathed, the Bible says, and is useful for teaching. This is what, what we use for teaching is the Bible. Rebuking, not popular in this culture, but, but the Bible says that pastors and leaders and, and even with each other, that that would be appropriate at times, trying to bring people back to their senses or back to the correct way. Correcting and training in righteousness. What's righteousness? It's doing the right thing, not according to the world, but according to God's plan. What is right? That is righteous. So let's Look at some proof that the Bible is the inspired word of God. I'm about to show you something that no other book in time or going forward will ever be able to do. So let's just look at the facts about the Bible. <clears throat> a, the Bible is not just a single book. The Bible is actually a collection of 66 books, which is called the canon of scripture. So 66 books of the Bible, right? And then secondly, A, and then two. That's how it's on the screen, so I'll go with it. Um, should be A and then B. These 66 books were written by 40 different authors. These authors came from a variety of backgrounds, shepherds, fishermen, doctors. Look at the difference in education here. Kings, prophets, and others. And most of these authors never knew one another. C, the 66 books were written over a period of 1,500 years. That's 1,500 years, okay? Think of this country, just a little over 200 years has existed. This book uh, was written over a period of 1,500 years. And then D, 66 books of the Bible, those books were written in different languages, three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. 
a reflection of the different historical and cultural settings. Now, not only does the book span the historical time, and it works in every generation, but it spans cultures, and it works in every culture as well. And there's no, really no other book that does that, okay? These 66 books were written on three different continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. And this collection of books, all of them, the 66 books, share a common storyline, the creation, fall, and the redemption of God's people. This collection of books shares a common theme, God's universal love for humanity. And these books share a common message. Salvation is available to all who repent of their sin and commit to following God. And then most remarkably, these 66 books contain no historical errors or contradictions, no real ones. You know, there's a place in the New Testament where it would say there was one angel, and then the same account would say there was two angels, and people say, oh, well, look at that. You know, they, they don't match. It's not real. It's contradictory. No, these are eyewitnesses. Some eyewitnesses saw one, other ones saw two. So nobody's lying. It's just what they saw, right? There's no real contradictions, which is amazing. One professor issued a challenge to a student who was saying, I don't believe that that's like the word of God. What makes that so special? And he said, okay, I, I challenge you, that's what he said to the student, to look at all the books in this world and then choose 66 books written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years in three different languages written on three different continents. And then these books must share a common storyline, a common theme, a common message with no historical errors or contradictions. And if you can produce such a collection of books, I'll admit that the Bible's not the inspired word of God. And the student said, well, that would be impossible. And he said, exactly. <laughs> it's remarkable. And if you will look at the facts, you can see that this is like no other book. I would add one more to that because I saw my dad's life change. It's a transforming book. It transforms you into the image of Christ. And no other book really changes people like this book does. So let me summarize. The Bible is the only collection of books that passes the test. 66 books written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years in three different languages on three different continents with no real historical errors or contradictions. Rather, The entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation bears the mark of divine inspiration. In examining the Gospels, we see Jesus' view of the Old Testament. I want to address that. I want to address it because some people say, well, I like Jesus, but that Old Testament, man, I'm not, you know, that's just weird with all the stuff and the killing and people going. And let me show you what Jesus thought of the Old Testament, right? If you're a follower of Jesus, he summed it up. You can sum it up his thought about the Old Testament in two words, total trust. People say, I like Jesus, not the Old Testament. Well, let me give you three things. Jesus recognized the entire Old Testament as authoritative. And people say, well, you know, there's, there's so much punishment. Listen, if you really read the Bible in the Old Testament, you'll see the grace and the mercy of God all through the Old Testament. He's trying to give people chances over and over again. The children of Israel are failing and doing the wrong thing. And again, he comes with his love and he's looking for people to repent. Even the generations, you remember there's a story of a really wicked king and he'd done so much bad and he repented and God forgave him. Grace is all through the Old Testament. But I'll, I'll tell you, in the New Testament, Jesus is the answer to all of the, of the grace and the mercy of God that is needed for all of us who sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's a meta-narrative of the scripture. Let me give that to you right now. That's meta-narrative means the overarching theme of the Bible. Here's the overarching theme of the Bible. Generation degeneration and regeneration. Generation is God creating. He generated, right? Degeneration is Adam and Eve sinned and all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the regeneration of humanity is God sending his son Jesus Christ to die for our sins, to pay the price so we didn't have to, to pay the price and we're regeneration, we're regenerated rather, we're born again justified as if we'd never sinned. That's the meta-narrative. 
So Jesus comes, he's bringing grace, but he's still embracing the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, he completely trusted the teachings. As you see in Matthew uh, 23, he said, the the books uh, of the Old Testament tell the story of who I am and why I'm coming. It's really one story headed to Jesus and the redemption of Jesus Christ. And then he says in another passage that I've listed there that you can trust the writings of Moses and others. And he said, you can't trust these teachers because they, they fall short. But the Bible, and, and remember, they didn't have the New Testament the day Jesus walked the earth. He was speaking the New Testament as, he, as it came out of his mouth. And, and the, the, the unique thing about the New Testament writers is they were eyewitnesses to Jesus Christ. And so the Holy Spirit inspired them and they wrote down not only what they knew, but what the Holy Spirit was showing them. And that's how these books formed. And Jesus said, the Old Testament's good too. That's what he said. Jesus quoted 14 different Old Testament passages. And I I want to um, share one more thing before we move on from the Old Testament as people are trying to comprehend, you know, the difference between the two because it's the new covenant. Jesus fulfilled The Old Testament, the Old Covenant was in the Old Testament. Now the New Covenant has come in Jesus Christ where grace and mercy is applied to our lives. But there were three aspects of the law in the Old Testament. There was the judicial, the ceremonial, and the moral aspects of God's law. The judicial would really be governmental. Uh, Every nation has a different government. Every city has different rules. And God never ever said that what Israel did governmentally is exactly what nations or or governments or or cities have to do in this culture. He never never made that sacred uh, uh, as they move through time there. So that, that doesn't necessarily apply to us, those judicial things that they, they did with the Jewish people. But then there was the ceremonial law, and that's where they would sacrifice an animal. An oxen would be slain by the priest. At the end of the year, there'd be forgiveness for sins of, for all, and the bloodshed was a sign of the remission or the ransom for sin. That animal stood in the place of receiving the wrath of God so that the people wouldn't. That sounds weird. But the New Testament... When we look at this ceremonial law, that was a ceremonial when they would slay animals and even pigeons if they didn't have much or whatever as part of a a sacrifice, that has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He's the spotless lamb. The wrath of God against sin fell on his own son. This is the beauty of, of salvation. We get to go to heaven because of this. That Jesus became sin so that we would not be bound by sin. So that we could be forgiven of our sin. He's the spotless lamb slain from the foundation of the earth for all of us. So there's no more sacrifices necessary. Jesus died once for all. That's the ceremonial. But one of the things I really want you to understand about the Old Testament that's so applicable for our lives today is is that moral aspect of the law. Remember the the judicial, the ceremonial, and the moral aspect, they never passed away. God's morality has been the same since day one. What was wrong in the Old Testament is, is wrong in the New Testament. Sexual sin, thou shalt not steal, um, thou shalt have no gods before me. Th- those are the Ten Commandments. Those are the moral aspects of law, and they carry over, and that's why we can still learn so much about obedience And the love of God and the blessing of God, we can learn that from the Old Testament and then bring in the grace of God in the New Testament. And and it all works together beautifully. So I'm giving you some understanding about the word of God and how Jesus loved the Old Testament and called it uh, good. Now, let's look at a second point today. The Bible is written to guide our path, to guide your path. I like the acronym B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. That's, that's pretty much what the Bible is, all right? We're going to be raptured someday. That's how we're going to leave the earth, or we're going to die, and we'll be raised up eventually. Basic instructions before leaving earth. D.L. Moody, an evangelist from many years ago, said the Bible is not given to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. Here's some scriptures guiding our path Psalm 119, which by the way is just an amazing chapter. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. And it's all about the Word of God. And I'll I'll just pull out a couple things from 
that wonderful chapter. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. If you're in his word, you understand the way to go that is blessed. You get a picture of darkness where if you wander off the trail, there's dangers out there. Pretty much, there's a lot of darkness in this world that we live in. There's a lot of, people say, all these wars, why would God allow it? Let me tell you what war is. War is people moving away from God's, God's will in the first place. If everybody would have done what he said, there would have been no war. He didn't cause the war. Our disobedience in this world causes the wars. He, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He came to provide peace. He, he's every good and perfect thing, and we've kind of messed it up, and we need him. We need him to, to bring peace to everything and to protect our families. He's a light on my path. He'll, as we talked about prayer last week, he'll show you who you're supposed to marry. I believe that. He'll show you where you're supposed to live. He'll help you to know if you're supposed to take that job or something's coming or stay for a season. He's got you, but his word provides all this as well. Now, I want to say this. Last week, we talked about prayer, and we talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, prophecy, word of knowledge. But I want to tell you that most of what God wants you to know is in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Like, I'm going to make this number up, but it's, it's probably more than this. At least 95% of what God wants you to know for your life is in the Bible. The other 5% he's going to help you discover as you go with all those factors that are unknown that couldn't be in the Bible, like who you're going to marry and that stuff, all right? But he'll guide you in those things. He'll help you. But he's trying to help you. Look at Psalm 119.4. He's not trying to make you obey him. If God wanted to, he could put a ring of fire around us right now and say, bow or burn, and we'd all bow. We would. But that's not who he is. He's a loving God. He's not going to force himself upon us. He gives us opportunity. And what I'm showing you today is this is a book of love. I call it the love letter of God, this Bible. It's to show us the way that's blessing, to show us the way that'll keep us from pain and heartache. And you can't escape all of that. But you're either going to go with hardship in this life, you're going to go with him through it or without him through it. And with him is way better. He'll just help you through it. He'll bring some good out of every bad thing eventually. And this isn't heaven, but, but as you follow his word, you'll get the best life possible in this earth. Psalm 119.4 says this, you've laid down your precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Obedience is taking a beating these days. Um, we're kind of acting like you can't even obey God. Well, what if you, what if you took that tactic with your three-year-old? She's never going to be able to obey. Just forget it. Uh, I think she's going to suffer quite a bit if we don't help her along the way. And you're going to suffer too if you don't help her or him, whatever the case is. But he can help us. He's trying to help us. And he'll say, if you'll obey, some people say, well, it doesn't work for me. And I'm just going to guess, because I've been there before too, that it's not working for you because you're not working it. Like that obedience thing. Like I didn't work it sometimes and I got in trouble. I didn't work with him. He was trying to work with me. But when I'm in and when the stubborn stand stops his nonsense of arguing with God and I get in, I find his blessing is right there if I will follow. It goes on to say, if you obey, you'll not be put to shame, huh? He's trying to keep us from trouble, not trying to make us do what he wants. It reminds me of that 17-year-old boy in your home right now who's telling you that he knows everything and that you can't tell him what to do because he's a man now. He's a man. You're not going to tell him what to do. He's going to join the Marines because nobody will tell him what to do there, will they? It's like you're trying to help the guy, you know. He doesn't have to do it, but if he does, you, you know, dad, mom, you love him. You're trying, to, you, you're trying to keep him from making mistakes you've made. You're trying to keep him on the path that will bless them and help them. It goes for girls too, not just guys. But it's like the person who would read the owner man, owner's manual for their new car, and it says, change the oil every 6,000 miles. And what if that man said, who do they think they are? telling me to change. I'll change my oil whenever I feel like it. I'll never change my oil. Okay, you can do that, but in the end, you're going to be picking up engine parts on the road. It will all bust up and fall apart. 
And that's the way it is with God's word. He's not trying to make you do something. He's trying to show you the smoothest and the best way. He's trying to keep you out of trouble and in his blessing and help you in your life. Now let's talk about a specific area. First of all, I thought this was interesting. I'm going to throw it in. In 1631, there was uh, finally permission for the Bible to be printed in English. Believe it or not, there were laws against it. This was before America, of course, and Europe. And, and uh, there was a publisher, Robert Baker, who came out with a version that became quite famous accidentally because they misprinted, they left out one word. For the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, they left out the word not accidentally. So there were a thousand copies that went out that said, thou shalt commit adultery. 400 years later, there's only nine of what they call the sinner's Bible left. <laughs> only, only nine of them. But they ceased immediately because that's not what they meant to say. But let's look at what God says about sexual immorality. And, and let me just say up front, I, I don't want to condemn anyone. Um, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there are young people and there are people who are trying to figure out which way to go in life. And if I'm so concerned about everybody that they might feel guilty, then I'll never say what people need to hear to be protected. And you know why priests were removed in the Old Testament? Because they didn't tell the people the word of God. I don't want to be removed by God. So I'm into prevention, not just cure. And to have prevention in people's life, you have to speak the truth that will keep them out of trouble. But the grace of God is still applied. And we'll talk more about that. We, if you've made mistakes, and most of us have, then we need the grace of God. But let's talk about sexual immorality. First Thessalonians, just to see what the word does for us. What, what it means to follow the word of God. First Thessalonians 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And that means you're forever growing. That you just keep growing in Christ. You're not, you're not there, but you want to be more like Jesus. You're in his word. You need his word to grow every day, by the way. And... And, and you're reading it and you're becoming more and more like him. That's sanctification. But it goes on to say, the will of God is that you abstain from sexual immorality. What is sexual immorality? If you look that up in the Greek, the original Greek would tell you that those two words mean any type of sex outside of a biological marriage between a man and a woman. Any sex before marriage and any sex outside the marriage of a biological man and woman. I have to say that today because there's really no other thing in the Bible, by the way. There's, there's, there's just no other thing. It's being made up. And this is why we must read the Bible because he speaks of the truth that will set us free in the Bible. And you say, you could get in trouble for that. I know. I know I could, but I told God when I started as a preacher, I'll preach it without fear or favor. That whole fear thing's getting harder and harder, but, but you know, courage isn't the absence of fear, it's the overcoming of it. So what I'm asking you is, if I get in trouble, will you come visit me in jail? That's what I'm asking. Or at least text me if you are afraid, okay? I'll need a little bit of encouragement. But I'm going to speak the truth that sets people free, and it's not because he doesn't like people, it's because God loves everybody, and he's showing the right way. The Bible says that when he created, he, he created male and female, and it was wonderful. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. So the message to this world isn't you're not good the way you are. The message is he made you beautiful. Just embrace how wonderful you are. That's the real message, and that's way more positive if you ask me. But did you know if we followed his plan that we wouldn't go outside that marriage between a man and a woman, there'd be no AIDS there'd be no venereal diseases. It's kind of like war that I was speaking of earlier. There'd be virtually no abortion. There'd be an overwhelming reduction in divorce. That's right. If I had people raise their hands, that sexual sin, that adultery that God's trying to warn us about destroys our families. People could say, yeah, my family was torn apart because of that. Again, I don't want to make anybody feel guilty. It's not... Where you've been with God, it's where do you want to go? He'll forgive you today. He'll give you a new future. But I'm going to tell you, if you sin sexually, I'm going to tell you something the Bible allows in marriage. It's such a grievous sin to your partner if you commit adultery that God says that the partner who's had adultery committed against them, Jesus said this, you have my permission to step out of that marriage. He said, except for the case of unchastity, that's, that's unfaithfulness in marriage. 
Now, he's not saying you have to. It's not what we recommend. We, we always shoot for healing in a marriage. But if that spouse, if that woman has, decides that she can't do it because trust is so completely broken, God says, I won't hold it against you. I give you permission. That's how bad it is. That's how hard it is. But God still loves and God still forgives. And even though he forgives, I'm going to tell you something. He'll forgive you, but you might not have your family when it's over. You might not have them because it, it was too much. I, I, I've told this story of a friend of mine before, a man of God. I just want to say, be careful in this area because better men and women of God than you have gone down because of this stuff. I, I wouldn't meet alone with the opposite sex if I could, outside of my marriage, for meetings, if, if, if I could. Do, I don't, by the way. And I don't mean to say... You know, anybody's bad. I just meet with someone if I'm going to meet with them. I just have someone with me. And the Bible says to flee the very appearance of evil. But if you don't think you can go down, you don't realize that your heart is desperately wicked, as the Bible says. So you guard yourself. You must guard yourself. That's what the Bible speaks of. Well, I'm, I'm kind of getting, uh, I don't know why I'm spending all this time on this, but um, my friend who was a man of God, told me that he was attracted to this woman. This is many, many years ago, decades. And he came to a moment where he was tempted to kiss her when they were alone. And he said he leaned in and she seemed ready to receive that kiss and he heard a voice say to him, this is going to cost you. He said he thought for a moment and he said to himself, I'm willing to pay that price. And he kissed her. And then they got in an adulterous relationship and it tore his family apart. Long story short, his wife lost her faith and they divorced. His children lost their faith in Christ. Not only that, but they wandered. They, they suffered with sin that so easily beset them. That's what I'll say. I don't want to get into specifics because I love this family. He lost all that. Now, eventually he repented and God forgave him. And I believe he's a man of God walking with God 30 years later. He's proven it for decades now. But I'm going to tell you something. He would stand in front of you and say, I lost a lot. I lost a lot. You're playing with fire. And, and so, you know, one of the ways we prevent this is by just staying close to one another, spending time together. I remember Candace, who's 31 now. I remember when she was three and she was hanging on to mama's leg as we're, we want to go out on a date. And she's just crying and screaming because she loves her mama. And we're trying to peel her off saying, listen, honey, we love you. But mommy and daddy need to be together. We, we need time together. Because the best thing you can do for your children is love your spouse if you want to teach them family, right? And so that would mean that they're not first in everything. God's first. And you know what? Mom came before you did. So we got we to gotta keep it together and love each other, and we got to figure this out, but we, you know, you'll know that we love you. Isaiah 48, 18. If only you had paid attention to my commands. This is God speaking to his people. Your peace would have been like a river. Your well-being like the waves of the sea. Go back. I think we skipped some. Go back. So this, this applies not only to sexual immorality, but it applies to all of life. The Bible's about everything. Your finances. You want to be a great business person? Man, the best instruction, because you'd never lie, cheat, or steal, and that'll keep customers coming to you, by the way. You'd be the best worker, do all you do as under the Lord, the Bible says. Even if you don't like the job, you're going to do your best, because you're a servant of the Lord, and you're a witness. And what happens is those kind of people get promoted. And God has all kinds of things about business in there that'll, that'll help you. About relationships. How do, how do mom and I treat one another? How do we treat our kids? How do we treat people in the workplace? The Bible says that we're, we esteem the other higher than ourselves. That's the opposite of the word. The world, rather. And, and the word says that, that, that his ways are best and he'll bless us. Virtually every important aspect of life is covered in the Bible. All right, third thing. The Bible lived out brings wholeness to our lives. Let, let me talk about grace for just a moment because the enemy would like to take some of this that I'm speaking and move it to condemnation for people who've made mistakes. And that, God 
we, we do have guilt. We own the guilt of our sin, but there's no condemnation in Christ. That everything offered to him with the heart that is there to, to, to accept Christ and to repent of our past, we can be forgiven. Years ago, uh, just, just a couple, I was in an airport with Karen and Candace, and um, we sat at a restaurant, and they brought the water out, and I have Dupuytrens in my hands. I don't know, you probably haven't noticed, but it's where everything's kind of drawing up. It's, uh, they call it the Viking's disease. Evidently, uh, Swedish blood will, will get that. And so I've got some in my, uh, in my history. But my hands are drawn up a little, so that pinky doesn't straighten out uh, like it normally would. Well, I'm kind of learning to live with that. And as I was reaching for something, my pinky caught the edge of my water. And I just tipped it all over. There's people all around. The glass falls off on the floor. It breaks. I'm thinking, bummer, you know. So the waitress brings me another glass. And I'm not kidding you. Just 30 seconds before, she had just brought it to me. And, and, and this time I'm thinking, okay, I got to be more careful. I don't want to spill the water. And, but there was a pedestal that was real thin on the bottom of the table. And I thought my feet were on the floor. So I'm trying to get the proper spacing for everything and back up so I can address this properly. But when I push myself back, I just, that whole table just thrust forward with my feet and my plate jumped off the table. As a matter of fact, I caught my salad plate, but I did not catch the salad, just the plate. <laughs> and that glass goes tumbling again. And 30 seconds after she brings another glass of water to my table, there's broken glass on the floor and my water's all over the place. And the first time, Karen and Candace were a little embarrassed. The second time, they're laughing at me now. They're laughing. <laughs> they think this is funny. I do not think it's funny. I'm mortified. She brings me the third glass of water. She would have brought it, I think, in a sippy cup, but she didn't have one. <sighs> now, I'm looking at that water. Now, listen, I've drank water all my life and haven't had much problems. But I looked at that water, and I thought, can I do it? <laughs> think I can do it. And I'm, I'm just so careful. I'm not, I'm just feeling like, man, I don't know. Can I do this? And you know what the Lord showed me out of that? He showed me how some people feel about their sin, that they've made so many mistakes that they don't know if they can do it. They don't know if God would want them. Of course he wants you. Of course he loves you. Of course he'll forgive you. But you've made mistakes. And what God wants to say to you is that his grace is applied to all that sin. You're justified when you come to Jesus, just as if you'd never sinned. And you can be forgiven. And not only that, you've got help. That truth of the Bible sets you free as you follow the Spirit of God comes. I say it takes willpower to get change in your life. Your will and his power. If you have a will and you want to do the right thing, he'll come with the anointing of his Holy Spirit and give you strength to step out and walk into things and be faithful like you never were before. Just felt like I had to throw that in about grace because it's so wonderfully important. But the Bible lived out brings wholeness. So let's look at eleven twenty-eight. These are the words of Jesus. He said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So it's not just to be read, it's something that will help us. Ronald Reagan said, the President of the United States formally said, within the covers of the Bible, the answers for all the problems men face. Jeremiah 17, look at the difference between my way and his way. This is what the Lord says, a curse, a curse rather, is placed on those who trust other people and depend on humans for strength. For those who have stopped trusting the Lord. Now, I know this is Old Testament, but it's still true in the, in the sense of, of following brings blessing and not following brings pain. Verse 6, it goes on to say, same passage, they're like a bush in the desert that grows in, the, in a land where no one lives, a hot and dry land with bad soil. They don't know about the good things God can give. If you don't follow the words, you can't, the word of God, you can't see the blessing that follows. You have, you have to go for it and be all in. You have to be a disciple that loves his word and, and applies his teaching. Verse seven, but the person who trusts in the Lord will be blessed. 
the Lord will show him that he can be trusted, <clears throat> meaning that God can be trusted. <clears throat> As you follow, excuse me. Goes on to say he will be strong. This is the one who follows the word. Like a tree planted near the water that sends out its roots by a stream. It's not afraid when the days are hot. And by the way, I want you to notice the days are hot and the trouble comes even when you're a Christian. Even when you're a follower of Jesus. Even when you're a disciple, you're going to have trouble. But God will help you through. God will make you an overcomer. And here, there, or in the air, you might have been listening to that song and say, uh, you know, God is good. You're good. You're always good. You might have been listening to that thing. I don't know. He hasn't been so good to me. But here's what I want you to know. Here, there, or in the air. You might be going through something hard right now, but, but he's, he's going to bless your future if you'll hang on. If you turn away from him, it's that barren place. If you turn to him, it's the strength to overcome. It's the wisdom to know where to go and, and the answer's on the way. And I, I mean, I don't know if I can do it, but this is my goal. Even if the good things don't happen to me in this life, I want to be so faithful to him because I know that there's no more problems in heaven and I want to go there and I believe him, I trust him. And so I say here, sometimes there's a miracle. There, sometimes it's down the road because we had to grow. You, you know, when Jesus was up on that cross, did you know he could have come down, but he didn't? And did you know he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Talking to his father. So even he felt abandoned. Think of that for those who think, well, you shouldn't speak those words. Well, this is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And God the Father turned away because it was so painful to see his son go through the suffering that he had to go through so that we might be forgiven. That's a loving dad, not, not a lack of caring. But Jesus stayed up on that cross. Now, I, whew, this is deep here. If God has a cross for me in this life, and it's him, I want to be on it. I want to be on it for the sake of others. Now, you know, it ain't over till it's over, and I haven't been faithful till I've been faithful, right? But my heart would be, you're so good, you're so loving, no matter what. If you don't even have just me in, in, in mind, you, you want to work through me to bless other lives. And sometimes as you go through a trial, you have no idea that your testimony is going to be the blessing on the other side that someone needs. Is it? I'm doing a lot of extra preaching to you guys. I'm sorry. But um, is it a greater, um, is it going to help you more to hear someone who's never had any trouble or made any mistakes or to hear someone who had a lot of trouble and made some mistakes but was forgiven, God helped them through, they overcame. That's the testimony that will encourage you to know, well, if they can make it, I, I can make it. Dave Reaver, his face literally blown off. That missionary who was machine gunned and was praising the Lord. He was just here a couple weeks ago, praising the Lord. He said the last thing he wanted to do before he went to heaven was tell God he was upset at him because he let him die in the desert. So he started to praise him. That's incredible. Okay. That's, that's pretty deep right there. That, that's the, only the second service got that one. You must be more mature in Christ. <laughs> Don't tell the first service I said that, though. Goes on to say, I go back. Um, I'm going to read it from eight again. If you trust in the Lord, you'll be strong like a tree planted near the water that sends its roots out by a stream and is not afraid when the days are hot. Its leaves are always green. <sighs> um, again, I'm just feeling like I need to stop and do some things here. Um, but I want to talk to the young people here. Man, take it. Take this truth. Walk faithfully. Walk with God. You do it early, you get blessings, man, that they just start to stack up. And, and uh, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm just talking about this, this tenacious obedience, this ready obedience that says, I trust him more than I trust myself. I trust his will more than I trust my own. Even, even sexuality. The world thinks they, they have something on us. They have no idea what the greatest sex is. I'm just telling you. All they've got is sex with two bodies, the physical. 
But when you're married and the two become one and you're committed to one another, you know what you have? You have body, soul, and spirit. You have intimacy. We're one. My eyes are for no one else. My affection is only for you. And there's something so beautiful in that that the world does not know. Now, they can know it. God, God can forgive them, and they, they can get right, and there's still time for everybody. But I'm just telling you, there's payoffs everywhere for trusting the Word of God. And I know that, you know, they, they told me when I was in college that sex was only 20% of a good marriage. I was sure that that must be wrong before I was married. But there's so much more about companionship and love and friendship and wholeness. And all of it comes with trusting the Lord and following him. I just want you to know there is a payoff. You say, well, how, you know, you, you talk with such arrogance. I'm sorry if it feels that way. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But I'm going to tell you something. I had parents that stayed together for 65 years and it was pretty great. Karen had parents that were together over 50 years before her mom died, and it was pretty great. We've been married for 42 years, and I know Karen doesn't look like she could be that old. She's, she's so beautiful, but man, it's, it's, there's a payoff. So I, I want to just um, end with this. Um, this is a Bible that my dad gave me. And... Um, you see that red stuff? You know, they, they have gold embossed now, and this isn't expensive. It's a cheap cover that's made to look like leather, and it's not. But it's, it's my most precious Bible. And um, it's because my dad wrote in here, presented to Stanley Russell. Yes, that's my name, and I don't love it either, okay? <clears throat> my, mi my middle name's Earl. Stanley Earl. Like Stanley wasn't enough punishment, you know. <laughs> I tell people my mom was still in labor when they said, he needs a middle name. And she said, oh. <laughs> so I'm Stanley, oh. Or doesn't it sound like a seal? Earl, Earl, Earl. <laughs> right? There's an Earl in the first service. I wouldn't have done that there, okay? <clears throat> But man, I, I love this book. Now listen to me. Not, not, not just this book. I love the word of God. I love it. It's never done me anything but good. Oh, I've gone against it. I was a prodigal. If you think I'm acting like I'm holy Joe, I'm not. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Ooh, but I learned when I was a prodigal out there doing all the wrong things, got away from home my freshman, sophomore year in college, and I messed up. A prodigal is someone who leaves on purpose. Yikes, that was me, your pastor. Says, God, I don't want your blessings here. I want to try this other stuff. Oh my, it hurts me to even say, but that's, that's what I did. And yet the story of the prodigal, the father is sitting on the porch watching and when he sees his son coming home and he see that he knows his son is messed up and has been eaten in the mud with the pigs and has nothing left. And God the Father runs to the son who's made these mistakes and he embraces him. And you know what I see when I read this word? I, I see that everything that my dad tried to put in me, and here's what he said, my wish that you will ever serve him. So my mom and my dad put this in me early and then, and then I went against it. And, and I, not only did I wound myself, I hurt others. I hurt people who love me. <clears throat> but the moment I came back, and it's not all about the rules. It's just that, you know, you're, you're safe. It's, it's safety. This is safety. <clears throat> it's not rules. It's safety. It's love. It's the best way to help you, not to hurt you or to make you obey. God doesn't do that. It's up to you. It's up to me. And when I said yes, everything started to turn around. Now, I haven't been perfect since I've come to Christ, but I'm becoming more and more like Jesus every day, every week, every year. That's my goal. To be faithful all the way and to keep growing. This word is amazing. I'm, I'm trying to jump it up in your hearts. Now, we're going to do something very practical. If we can move it along, let's go to um, 
Well, let me read this verse. <clears throat> first, Joshua 1, 8. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night. So this is the word of God. If we're going to get in our heart and not be influenced by the culture, if you don't know what the word says, you're going to be influenced by the culture more than God's way. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be sure to obey. There's that word again, obey. Everything written in it. And listen to what it says. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. What? I looked up the word all in the Hebrew. And you know what it means? It's, it's fascinating. It means all. <laughs> all you do. That if you take this word that he'll bless you in every aspect of life. It's not that there wouldn't be trouble, but you're going to come out on the right end eventually. This, this book is success in life. And I'm not talking about monetarily. I'm talking about holistic trust in God and his word. This love letter, this map for life. These basic instructions before leaving earth. It's for us. So I, I want you to read it. To meditate uh, on it, as that word says, uh, there, there's a cultural meaning back in the day where it was written where a, a cow would chew a cud. Those farmers know what that is, but it's something that they have that they just chew on all the time. And the idea is to look at that word and spend time in it and let it change you and look deeply and ponder it, meditate it over and over again. It's going deep. So here's a practical way that, that I think can help you. Now, if you love to just read the, you know, a, you know, hold the pages and move through the Bible this way and mark your Bible. That's cool. But, but since 80% of you are giving online now, think of that. 80% of the giving is online now. Uh, most people are moving around on their phones and their computers. So I want to help you with a tool that we have for you. Uh, it's, it's, we have a church app, and in that app is one or two chapters that are, that are written exclusively for us, prepared for us, so we can be reading the same passages as we go together. There's, it's about 10 minutes, the reading, <clears throat> might be 7 to 12, but there's usually one to three chapters. There's only one chapter if it's long. That was this morning's reading. It was a long chapter. <clears throat> and then if it's just normal, it's two chapters. If it's short chapters, it's three, but just it's doable. <clears throat> so I want to show you how to do this. This is what Karen and I do. We go here every day and we read it. Now, you, it's not reading through the Bible in a year, just a couple chapters a day. But what it does is cover most of the Bible, and it skips the parts in Leviticus with 198 names that you don't know what, what that means, right? When it's talking about lineage there, those kind of passages, and it gets you into key passages in the New Testament, the Old Testament. We love it. And so we listen to it. You can listen to it, and we read it at the same time. And we can pause and talk about it, and then we can make notes and highlight even, even on the phone. Or, or uh, which is how we read it in the mornings. And then we pray. Karen and I spend time together almost all the time every day. Not every day, but almost every day. And, and so, so I want to show this to you. So if, just open your phone up if you can. If you're over 60, hold off and find someone 14 and they will help you get this, okay? These guys right here, they can get you there in just a couple minutes. All right? <clears throat> um, but here's, here's how to access the daily Bible reading on our Church Center app. Number one, search Church Center on the Apple app or the, or the Google Play store. The Apple app store or Google Play, just put Church Center in there. This is something that a lot of churches use, but you put your own information in, okay? And it goes specifically to our church and what we've placed in there. Number two, tap Get Started. Okay, that's part of this. Number three, this is just the initial setup. Select search manually, and then enter your church, Horizon Community Church, in Tualatin, Tualatin campus. Number four, select Horizon Community Church, Tualatin campus. Uh, number five, select this is my church, just to confirm. Number six, enter your mobile phone number. And you know how that works if you've done this before with other things. A digital code will be texted to you. Uh, enter it. Uh, here to confirm your identity. So they want to make sure that it's you. And after you've done that, uh, just understand that all that is, are the steps initially for setup. And you, you'll have to do all, all, you don't have to do all of that all the time. And, and then number eight, now you're in. So every morning you just go to, you hit your app and you hit select Bible reading at the center of 
of, of the screen on the bottom and, and you tap daily Bible reading and it'll go for you. And you'll get, you'll get the one, two, or three chapters and you can have it speak it. You can choose it in different versions, select a translation there and you're off and running. Now, if you haven't been reading the Bible and you're, I mean, just listen to it. Listen to it on the way of work and meditate on it. You can just run it on your phone as you go to work. I'm all for worship music. We'll talk about worship next week, and it's awesome. But man, I think the, the, the scriptures are better than worship. I mean, it is worship when you get into the scripture, and the Bible doesn't say any different than that. The Word of God is elevated above all else. And, and so, so that's just a tool that I want to help you with. I, we love that tool. It's there for you. We went to a lot of trouble to set it up. And uh, may, perhaps you could enjoy that. So, concluding, read the Bible. That's the whole point of today. Apply it to your life. Obey it. Those who don't will wonder, struggle, and suffer loss. Those who do will experience the best life possible on this earth. Not, not, not that everything's perfect or not hard. The best life possible. There'd be things to work through that are hard. The death of loved ones, that sort of thing as you go. It's pointed to man wants to die but it's still the best life possible. He'll help you with everything. I want you to bow your heads and we're gonna pray. I'm gonna ask if you'd lift your hand. <clears throat> if you would say, Lord, I purpose in my heart to read your word on a regular basis. And I'm gonna say five times a week. To read your word on a regular basis because I, I know I need it, Lord. I know it's good. And I know you wanna bless my life. I hear from your word today the truth and I want to follow it. Now, maybe you're doing that, but I, if you are already, I want your hand to go up too. Lord, I commit to it. I commit to it. Just No one looking around. Just lift your hand. Lord, I commit to your word. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so many. Lord, would you bless it to the hearts of those who are reaching? And Lord, would you protect those? Would you help those who still aren't sure yet to know it's, it's not you telling them what to do. It's you blessing them. And so, Lord, teach us Lead us, guide us. In Jesus' holy name, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I want us to pray uh, <clears throat> a prayer to invite Jesus into our hearts. We're not going to lift hands this morning, but we're all just going to pray together. And if you want to accept Jesus as your personal Savior, would you pray this with all of us? Many of us know Christ. Many of those who are here may not, but it all starts with inviting him into your heart and making him the Lord of your life. And the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ was crucified, that he's risen from the dead, you'll be saved. And that's what this prayer is about. Are you ready to receive Christ? Everyone, including those who want to come to Christ, just pray this with me right now. Say, Father God. Yeah, everyone together, please forgive me. I've sinned and I've made a lot of mistakes, but I believe that you love me. I believe that you gave your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. Jesus, come into my heart and make me brand new. I'm going to follow you with my life. Thank you for saving me and for forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.